you. As I said, we've got a group going to Nepal, and uh, you want to pray for their safety and pray for uh, just the power of the gospel as it uh, goes into the villages that many will come to Christ. And as you know, when you go that far to a different culture and a different setting, there's all sorts of issues that can come up, and so we would covet your prayers uh, to pray and uh, that we will catch our flights on time and much more than that, that we would be at the places where the Holy Spirit could use us the most effectively. And uh, it's already been said, I appreciate uh, uh, Cecil and you guys. Thank you so much for, uh, that was so meaningful. Thank you. And we're so a blessed nation uh, to be able to, uh, to live uh, in a nation where people have sacrificed so much that we could have uh, so many blessings that we have. But today also, is uh, the Davises, uh, Gary and Carla, anniversary. And uh, we want to wish you guys a happy anniversary. Is it like uh, 40, what now? 46. And uh, let me tell you what a sorry rascal I am. You already knew that, but let me just help you to know that. Uh, the night before our anniversary is the 21st, and, and the night before I said, Deanna, I'm going to take you out. I said, let's go find a, a great place in Dallas, so let's go out and eat. And I had it on my, we talked about Rod Masseller was in this week for our senior adult revival. And I said, Rod, let's go to get dinner. And I said, Deanna, you want to go? So we went to dinner. I forgot all about our anniversary. I forgot about taking her out. I forgot about, we went out with Rod, got home that night. Deanna had uh, some little uh, goodies she bought at the store, and she said, happy anniversary. <laughs> this is like the second or third time I've forgotten it. So here's what I want you to do. She's in the nursery right now. Would everybody put in your phones right now, Tommy and Deanne's anniversary, call Tommy. He can't remember. Remind me next year. Please do that. I mean, I felt terrible, terrible. I sent some flowers later in the week, tried to make up for it. It just doesn't make up for it. I don't know. Something about it just doesn't work. And I'm glad that you two remember. Who remember? Who said it first to each other this morning? Gary? Gary, we will write it down for you too, okay? And uh, well, we pray. Remember tonight, there's no uh, church tonight for many of you have activities with your families or be traveling. Pray that you would be safe this weekend. And, but I'm so glad that you're here today uh, with many of your families who've come in uh, to study and to grow and hear God's word. Amen. Let's pray together. Uh, Father, we thank you for this nation again. Thank you for those that have sacrificed so much. But Father, when we think of sacrifice, we think of what you have done, of giving your only son that he would take on himself our sins in order that we might have the freedom that we have in Christ today to celebrate and rejoice of what he's done in our heart. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Where's the beef? You remember that? In 1984, that commercial hit the airways. And it was such a great commercial. The indication of that commercial is that Wendy's was trying to say that McDonald's and Burger King, they had these big old buns, but inside the buns, there wasn't any, hardly any beef uh, to be found. And so the phrase, where is the beef? Clara Peller was the one that we were most famous for of saying the line, where's the beef? And when she said that line, she received a hamburger and she was looking through the big bonds and if she was looking, she said, where's the beef? But the director of the commercial literally wanted it to say, where's all the beef? But Clara had emphysema. And to say that phrase was too hard for her to get it out, so they just cut it shorter to simply say, where's the beef? There was a lot of promos that peeled off from that. There was a song that made a hit uh, during that time. There were bumper stickers that said, where's the beef? There was Frisbees that said, where's the beef? And not only that, we find there came out with a game board that said, where's the beef? But somebody could have given Christ a slogan, that he could have said this slogan, where's the fruit? 
when Jesus looked at Israel and began to examine them, what he found is they were barren. They were fruitless. And Jesus could have called out and said, where's the fruit? Where's the fruit, Israel? If we've been reading together in our Bibles, we've come this week in our readings, we've come to Mark chapter, Mark chapter 11. And we're reading about Jesus last week on this earth in his ministry. But particularly, we're going to pick up on Tuesday after his triumphal entry in Jerusalem. And we're going to see that Jesus could have said to Israel, where's the fruit? As we read together in Mark chapter 11, we pick up in verse 12 that you've already read this week. But notice with me again as we read it again together. On the next day, when they had left Bethany, he became hungry. And seeing at a distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if perhaps he would find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for the figs. And he said to it, May no one ever eat the fruit of you again. And his disciples were listening. Verse 15. Then they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who were buying and selling in the temple and overturn the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who were selling doves. And he would not permit anyone to carry merchandise through the temple. And he began to teach and say to them, it is, not, is it not written that my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations? But you have made it robbers' den. The chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how to destroy him, for they were afraid of him. For the whole crowd was astonished at his teaching. And when evening came, they would go to the, out of the city. And in verse 20, notice it says, As they were passing by in the morning, which would have been Wednesday morning now, they saw the fig tree withered from its roots up. And being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look, for the fig tree which you curse has withered. We find at this time in Jesus' ministry that Jesus is spending his last week in Jerusalem. And as Jesus was spending that last week in Jerusalem, two main points that I want you to see that are in your talk notes. The fruitlessness of the fig tree. It's Tuesday morning. Jesus and disciples are up, and they are walking from Bethany. And it would literally have been, as they were walking from Bethany, they were on the other side of the Mount of Olives, and they were walking across the Mount of Olives, and they would be walking down in the Kidron Valley and then back up to the temple. And as they were up that morning, leaving the house of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, and as they were leaving, Jesus spots a fig tree. He was hungry that morning. And he sees this fig tree, and it was full of leaves, indicating that it should have some unripe figs upon it. It's interesting about the fig tree that before the leaves come on the fig tree, there were these buds that were edible that would come on the tree, and then followed by that were the leaves. It was Passover time, and so it was probably around March. The, the fig trees would not be harvested until late summer, early fall, but there should have been those edible buds on the tree, which Jesus was looking for, even though it was not the harvest time for the figs. And Jesus goes to the tree and, and, and wades through all the leaves, and he sees that there, there's no figs on it at all. And then we notice in verse 14, notice what he says. He says to it, may no one ever eat fruit of you again. And his disciples were listening. Some would say that Jesus was angry at this point. That Jesus was upset at this point. But I, I think it's best not to take it that way. That Jesus was angry, that he was disappointed. He was only using this fig tree 
as a symbol of the barrenness, the fruitlessness of Israel at this time. And he was showing through symbolically of this fig tree that Israel was much like this fig tree. It was barren, spiritually barren. There was really no fruit in Israel at this time. They were showing signs of life. They were showing signs by having leaves, by having religious activities, but inside of their heart of heart, they were barren. I want you to take note that this is the only destructive miracle that Jesus ever performed in the Bible. It's the only one, unless you want to consider the swine that ran into the Sea of Galilee and drowned. But this would be the only destructive miracle to take place. And we find that the tree abandoned in its purpose. The only reason for the fig tree to exist was to bear fruit, to bear edible figs, and there was nothing on it. And so this tree abandoned it, its responsibility. And it's the same for Israel. Israel was created. It was made to bear fruit for the Lord, to bring glory and honor to the Lord, but they abandoned the responsibility of what they've been created for. They left behind what God had said. Now it's Wednesday, and I want you to go down in your Bible to verse 20 and verse 21. Tuesday, Jesus cursed the fig tree, but now it's Wednesday in verse 20 and 21. Notice what was said. And as they were passing by in the morning, they saw the fig tree. It was withered from the roots up. Being reminded, Peter said to him, Rabbi, look. The fig tree which you curse has withered. The final display of the barrenness of Israel would happen just in two days. It would be when Jesus Christ went to the cross on Friday. It was a symbol of just how barren they were, that Jesus was dying for the sins of the nation of Israel, for the people. But not only for Israel, but for the world at that time. But he was displaying through the cross of just how barren and dead they were, that they needed a Savior. And they just didn't see it. They they didn't recognize it. You see, Israel had every opportunity in the world to bear fruit. Listen, it was in Israel which they had God's written word. They had God's written word. They had the Old Testament in which they could study and read and and allow the word of God to, to penetrate their lives in order that they would bear fruit for him. They had the prophets, the prophets that would come and say, thus says the Lord. They had the prophets of God, but then later they had the word which became flesh and dwelt among them. They had every opportunity. They had the prophets. They had the Word of God, and they had the Word of God, the Son of God, the Messiah that came. They had every opportunity to bear fruit, but we find at this time they were barren. Barren. And Jesus is using the fig tree to show that. We could read Isaiah 29, 13, which says it so well, which speaks of where they were at this time. Isaiah says, because this people draw near with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts from me and their reverence from me consists of traditions learned by rote. You see, it looked like Israel was alive. It looked like they were vibrant. Look at all the religious activities. Look all they're doing. Man, they were full of leaves. But when you could get through the leaves and you got inside the tree, you got inside their lives, you see how dead and barren and fruitless they really were. They were dry and barren. But you see, that's why God has placed you here. God has placed you here as a believer in order that you would bear fruit. Jesus said in Matthew 5, chapter 16, let your light shine before all men, for they may see of your what? Your good works, your fruit. They may see of the fruit of Christ in your life in order then that they might glorify the Father 
which is in heaven. Israel was fruitless. It was barren. But that's not what he wants for you or for me in our lives. He wants us to bear fruit. He doesn't want people to have to dig through all the leaves in our lives. He wants people to be able to see Christ up front in us. That we are growing in the image of Christ, and it should be the desire of every believer, every follower of Christ. It should be our desire that we would bear his fruit. And how do we do that? How do we bear the fruit of Christ in our lives? It's by getting into the Word and allowing the Word to get into our lives. And if you're here today and that is your desire and your passion that you would be one that would bear fruit for Christ, listen, you've got to get into the Word of God and allow the Word of God to get into you. Let me ask you today, is that your desire Is that your desire in your life that you would bear fruit for the glory of Christ and for his honor and for his glory? God is looking for men and women and young people that would say, man, that is my desire, that is my passion, that I would bear fruit for him. The fig tree, the fruitlessness of it. But second, I want you to see the fruitlessness of the temple. You know, the, the fig tree was only really a, a prelude of what Jesus is going to do in the temple. We find that Jesus entered the temple and he began to cleanse the temple. But this is not the first time that Jesus cleansed the temple. This is the second time recorded in the scripture that Jesus went into the temple and cleansed it. The first time is recorded in John chapter 2, as Jesus began his ministry, he went into the temple and he cleansed it. And now at the end of his ministry, we find that Jesus is cleansing the temple. And when Jesus entered the temple, it was a magnificent place. It was a magnificent place. It covered 35 acres. This temple that we're talking about is the one that we would refer to as Herod's temple. Herod's the one that began to renovate restore, rebuild the temple. And it began in 19 or 20 B.C. The inner part of the temple, he finished in 18 months. But the main structure of the temple, the buildings, it took 10 years. But the courtyards and everything were not finished until 64 A.D. Just six years After it was finished, it would be destroyed by Rome in 70 A.D. I want you to catch a little bit of the magnificence of the temple, of the beauty. Josephus, the Jewish historian, he writes these words. He writes, the exterior of the building lacked nothing that could be astonished, either the soul or the eyes, for beginning for being covered on every side with massive plates of gold. The sun had no sooner risen than it radiated so fiery a flash that those straining to look at it were forced to avert their eyes from the solar rays. He also writes about the temple and he says, to the approaching strangers, it appeared from a distance like a snow-clad mountain. The reason being, that whatever was not overlaid with gold was the purest white. And Jesus entered the temple. But Jesus was not taken back by the beauty and the grandness of the temple. What he was taken back by was just how bare and lifeless the activities that were occurring in the temple. He entered the temple. And we find that he drove out the money changers. And he drove out those that were buying and selling. And the temple became so casual and so flippant that people would use the temple to cut through to go to the other side of the city. Many times our parking lot by the office, you almost get run over. People use it all the time like it's a street. 
they use it to cut through to go to a different place instead of going around through uh, the way they should by the roads. They just run through the office area parking lot all the time. And Jesus saw that kind of flippant attitude in the temple. Instead of walking around the temple, people would say, instead of going around something at 35 acres, we're just going to cut through. It makes it easier. It's quicker. And Jesus was saying, man, what, what are you doing? This is to be a place of holiness, a place to worship God, a, case, a place that we don't come in here casually to do. But you're treating it so casual and so flippant of how you see it. He turned over the money changers' tables. And you can imagine that the money that was falling on the ground and rolling on the ground. He turned over those that were selling uh, doves. He turned over those tables. And you wonder why? Why, why was Jesus taking such a, a harsh approach to all this? Annas was the former high priest. Rome removed Annas. Even though Rome removed him, Annas was still the high priest. Make no mistake about it. He was still the man in charge. He was still calling the shots. But his son-in-law, Caiaphas, is acting as a high priest. And everything that happened in those 35 acres in the temple, it had to go through Annas and Caiaphas. And so those that were vending, those that were selling there, had to get their permission. And so people would bring lambs to sacrifice from a great distance. But in order to sacrifice a lamb, you had to go through a priest. Listen to this. And the priest had the ability to say, ah, your lamb doesn't match up. Well, what do you mean it doesn't match up? There's not a spot. There's not a scar. There's not a blemish. Man, this is a perfect lamb. I'm telling you, as a priest, it doesn't match up. You've got to go and buy one of our lambs. And they would raise the price. It was an extreme. It was an extortion what they were doing. And they would raise the price of animals. But inside the temple was there everything that you would need to give a sacrifice. There was lambs. There was oil. And there was wine. And there, there was the salt that was used in the sacrifice. Everything that was needed to give a sacrifice was there. And listen to this. Not only did they exhort a high upward charge on everything that was there, Annas and Caiaphas got their cut. They got a cut. And not only did you have to pay an extraordinary price and get the permission of the priest to offer your animal, if you could get that through, you had to exchange your money for the temple tax, which was offered once a year. And it could only be given through a Jewish coinage or tires coins and that were presented there. And some scholars say they would raise the price at least 25%. It was extortion at its finest level. And that's what was happening in the temple. And you could see Jesus' anger of, of what he was seeing. Where is the zeal for the name of God? Where is the passion for God? It was gone. It was gone. And so Jesus begins to drive it out. And matter of fact, the court of Gentiles was given in the name, the Bazaar of Annas, it was called at that time. Because he controlled everything that was happening in that courtyard, knowing also as well that he was becoming rich. And during that time of the Passover, it is estimated there was a quarter of a million animals sacrificed. Listen to what I said, a quarter of a million animals sacrificed. Can you imagine the amount of wealth that Caiaphas and Annas were receiving during the Passover, only through that one season, not counting the whole year of sacrifices, man, they were becoming lucrative. It was an incredible business, not only for them, but those that they allowed to trade and sell there. And what was amazing is, is that no one tried to stop Jesus. 
Nobody lifted a hand against him. Man, this was money to be made. This was money that they were gaining, but no one dared, which speaks of his unbelievable power and authority in which he had. And Jesus was so utterly disgusted in what they were doing. In Mark chapter 11, verse 17, notice what he says. And he began to teach and say to them, And it is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations. And this first um, part is the scripture that Jesus quotes out of Isaiah 56, 7. He said this is to be a place of worship. This is to be a place that we come to honor and bring glory to God. And notice what he says next. He quotes from Jeremiah 7, 11. But you have made it a robber's den. And you have made it and turned it into a place where crooks exhort money and steal and corrupt money from the people. And he said, what have you done? And they looked so religious on the outside, didn't they? Look at all the activities. Look at all the animals. Look at all the blood that was being slain. But Jesus was saying it was barren. It was empty. There was no spiritual fruit in anything that was happening. Notice with me in verse 18 and 19, the chief priests and the scribes heard this and began seeking how they can destroy him. So they were afraid of him. They were afraid of him. For the whole crowd was astonished at his teachings. And when evening came, they would go out of the city. What authority and what power Jesus displayed. But I believe in this passage, there's some takeaways for us, just as there was in the barren fig tree. The first takeaway that we see is to ask the question, have you lost Christ at church? Here they were in the midst of all the activities that we're doing, all the things, but they were spiritually dead, spiritually fruitless, even in the midst of the temple. They were at the most holy place in all the world, and they lost him. You see, they were coming to a building, but they were not coming to Christ. And you know it's possible to be here this morning and that you have come to a building, but you haven't come to Christ. See, you have performed your religious activities this morning. You have taught Sunday school. You have brought donuts and coffee. You have done your activities. You've done the announcements. You've done the publicity. You've done the teaching. You've done the things that are religious that look like the leaves. But somehow in the midst of all the activity, you have not come to Christ. I wonder if you're like the people that Jesus was confronting at that time. That you have lost Christ at church. Oh, it's possible to do it. It's possible for your pastor to do it, the staff members to do it, and it's possible for you to do it as well, that today you come to the activity of of this hour, to, to this place, but in the midst of all the activity, you have never encountered Christ. 